Last week, the sound guy had some great suggestions. This week, the camera guy thinks he has a great idea. Ole! Oh my goodness! Hi everyone. This video is part of a series where we are taking a look at IMU devices. That is, devices that measure movement in the real world. This video is part B on accelerometers. You can check out part A in the technology playlist on my channel. In part A, we took a look at the basic physics of a MEMS. Let's see how they're constructed. There are three basic methods of constructing an accelerometer. Piezoelectric, piezoresistive and capacitive. All of these methods still rely on the basic principle of detecting how a small mass moves and translating this to an electrical signal. A piezoelectric accelerometer is where the proof mass compresses a piezo crystal, which generates an electrical impulse. You will find these mainly used for detecting shock and vibration. These accelerometers are constructed with a piezo ceramic material such as lead zirconate titanate or PZT or single crystals of quartz or tourmaline. This type of construction has several pros and cons. They have a low package weight. They can be used in applications with high temperature ranges. They are responsive to changes in acceleration but are subject to high noise. A piezo-resistive accelerometer is constructed with a proof mass at the end of an armature and piezo-resistors or strain gauges that measure the electrical resistance of the armature when it is under stress. These accelerometers are constructed with the same materials as piezoelectric accelerometers. These accelerometers require a complex fabrication process and are therefore expensive. However, they can measure high g-forces. They suffer from limited high frequency response. Like piezoelectric, they are subject to high noise and low accuracy. Capacitive accelerometers are created by suspending the proof mass and armature between two plates. This allows the capacitance to be measured between the armature and the wall of the accelerometer. This is the most popular construction method. These devices are made on silicon wafers, which is the cheapest and most reliable manufacturing process around. Consequently, this makes them very cheap to manufacture because they are simple to make. They are influenced less by noise and temperature are reliable in operation, have a higher accuracy than piezos, but suffer from low responsiveness and can only measure low acceleration. There are also some other methods that aren't commonly used, for example Hall effect, optical and thermal. In Hall effect, instead of using a variable capacitor or resistor, the intensity of a magnetic field is measured. Optical, some optical MEMS have been successfully tested in lab some years back, but I haven't seen any commercially available optical MEMS on the market. Thermal. This is a small dome that heats up air and detects how that air moves. These are very expensive and are usually out of the scope of the average maker. Note that accelerometers are usually designed to only measure in the one plane, so MEMS manufacturers will house three devices rolled into one, providing the three axes X, Y and Z. Okay, so we've looked at the physics, electrical characteristics and construction of an accelerometer. Let's see how an accelerometer delivers this to an external device. Depending on the type of accelerometer you use will depend on how this information is presented to you. There are basically two ways, analog and digital. Analog is the simplest way and provides analog voltage outputs indicating the acceleration component. Depending on your application you can use this signal straight or more typically you would use an MCU with an onboard ADC to convert the voltage to digital. Some examples of MCUs with onboard ADCs are the Atmega series, of course the Raspberry Pi, and high-end MCUs such as the LPC series. Digital accelerometers are by far the most common these days and provide acceleration data via a serial bus. You will find MEMS capable of connecting to the popular I2C and SPI buses. Depending on your project needs, you'll have to be mindful of which accelerometer to select. For example, a high accuracy accelerometer may not contain an I2C bus. Okay, so we've taken a look at the physics, construction, electrical characteristics and connectivity of an accelerometer. Let's look at how to select an accelerometer for your application. We have seen a number of mechanical and electrical problems that cause errors in MEMS. When selecting an accelerometer, there are several key factors you need to take into account. Range, sensitivity and resolution, zero-g offset, noise and drift, temperature range and the sampling rate. If you go to any manufacturer's website, you can usually download the datasheet for the device. 
This is the data sheet for the MPU9150. Taking a look at the full scale range section, you'll notice that this MEMS has a number of programmatically selectable ranges from 2Gs up to 16Gs. Moving down to sensitivity, since this device has digital outputs, the resolution units are LSB over G. To determine the actual resolution requires some calculation. If the lowest range is selected, 2Gs, then we have 4Gs worth of values that need to be expressed in the 16-bit word size. This means that a 1-bit resolution would be 61 milliGs. Moving to temperature, this device has a drift in resolution of plus and minus 0.02% per degree change. To find out the baseline temperature of the device, look at the top of the page. You'll find that most devices have this set to 25 degrees Celsius. The 0G or offset bias is important for calibration. This particular device has an X and Y axis variance of up to 160 milliGs, whereas on the Z axis, it's almost a third of a G variance. The next section on the data sheet shows you the potential change in bias over a given temperature range. This is important to know if your project will be getting close to any of the temperature range extremes. Noise performance tells you how the device is affected by noise when fetching data at a particular rate. This device introduces errors at 400 micro G's per hertz. The sampling rate shows you how fast you can actually poll or fetch data from your device. To get an idea of just how this device will respond in a real world scenario, it's important to take into account all these factors. If you select the lower scale, 2 G's, and the temperature is 25 degrees Celsius, the 0G output will oscillate between plus or minus 150 milliGs or 300 milliG on the Z axis. But there's also a plus or minus 3% initial tolerance, which means worst case scenario, you will have a plus or minus 154.5 milliGs or 309 milliG variance. Taking into account that the one bit resolution is 61 milliGs, the data output will potentially oscillate between five to six digital values. This is at room temperature. Now let's look at an extreme, say a typical Australian summer max of 45 degrees Celsius. Now we introduce the temperature variance of plus or minus 0.02% per degree change. So now we have a plus or minus 216.3 milliG error or a 432.6 milliG variance. This means you will see the output fluctuate randomly between seven to eight digital values. I was originally going to include in this video how to programmatically deal with errors, but I think that topic is better left to another video. Thanks for watching this video on accelerometers. In part two of this series, we're taking a look at gyroscopes, which allows you to measure the rotation of a device. Until then, see you next time.